So our speaker tonight, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Father Cashin Koneman. Father Koneman is a monk, priest, and the prior of St. Louis Abbey. He teaches friendship with God and the theology of marriage at St. Louis Priory. Father Cashin brings a monk's single-mindedness to the lover's pursuit of the beloved, and he has this need for this kind of focus in a life that juggles teaching, advising teens, looking after the infirm members of St. Louis Abbey, cooking, offering the sacraments to parishioners, praying four hours a day, recreating and socializing with friends and fellow monks, and tending to the many and varied obligations and requests. I think advising teens, you probably could have stopped there and that would have been good. Plenty to do there. St. Therese of Lisieux wrote, to enjoy God's mercy, one must humble oneself, recognize one's nothingness, and that is what many souls do not want to do. This monk's single-mindedness has taught him to integrate this practice into a busy and varied life, and now he wants to teach us how to use this, how this kind of humility can help find a way to enjoy God's mercy at a deeper level. So thank you, Father Cashin, for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you here this evening at St. Gerard Magella. I grew up uh, in part over at Christ Prince of Peace in St. Anselm's, so I probably played soccer against some of your children once upon a time. Picture with me for just a moment uh, a large raft. It has 12, 20 somethings in the raft and they have helmets on. If you are of the Jesuit style of prayer, you can put yourself into the raft for the coming story. Or if you're not, you can just listen along. This little group is at the end of the Ocoee River and the raft has taken on quite a bit of water and so they've pulled off to the side to empty the raft before they sunk. And up in front of them is the Olympic course, the Whitewater Olympic course, which due to the, the system of dams is always roaring with water every single day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the team makes its choice to go dead straight through the Olympic course as 20-somethings would. And they're advised, well, of course, there will be people on the other side with um, life preservers that, and ropes that will throw them at you once you eventually come back up for air. And the team goes down the river, navigates the first couple of turns of the Olympic course, and very quickly hits a bump that throws the entire raft, myself included, straight backwards into the water and into a complete wreck. The reason I use this little story is that I think that there are two ways to fail in the spiritual life. The first, the easiest to see, is by way of overconfidence, presumption. These 20-somethings headed right straight into the heaviest uh, waves of the Olympic course without the skill to navigate them. The second is by faint-heartedness. Uh, a lack of confidence, or you could also say an excess of humility, even good humility. And in that way, you can actually be swamped by the water in, in a tumultuous, you know, uh, environment. You can actually take on too much water by being too timid, and you'd have to, you know, at least get out and empty the boat from time to time if you didn't lose the boat in the process. That's so much to say that there are two sides of the spiritual life, and they need to be kept together. One side is a healthy humility, a healthy humility that seeks discernment, seeks God's help, prays actively and often for God to help in everything, in all the little details of life as well and in a very heartfelt way. And without that, you do run the risk of presumption. On the other side, you have too much confidence in God, 
Oh, on that side, you have too much confidence in God and not enough humility. On the other side of faint-heartedness, you have too much humility and not enough confidence in God. And as a result, perhaps not enough confidence in yourself as well. And that leads, without the confidence that's necessary, it leads to confusion, discouragement, despair. So how do we keep the two of them together? That is our objective for our brief little talk this evening. I follow the advice of a guide. His name is Blessed Columba Marmion. He is the most recent Benedictine to be raised to the altars. He lived uh, from 1856 to 1923. Uh, he was an Irishman uh, who entered a monastery in Belgium called Mered Sioux. And he uh, was a huge spiritual author of his time. Uh, his, his books are all still in print to this day, 99 years later. And I've written a, a, a brief little book about him called The Grace of Nothingness, Navigating the Spiritual Life with Blessed Columba Marmion. His spiritual resume includes the fact that the Pope himself sought Marmion's con uh, counsel on whether to canonize St. Therese of Lisieux. So if you happen to be a fan of her, I argue in the book that he is one of the first to integrate some of her spirituality into a greater whole uh, and to bring some dogmatic insights along with it. Uh, and then later, he has a great influence on Mother Teresa, uh, and she, she quotes him extensively and also on the topic right here at hand, uh, so much so that she almost tried to put him into the constitutions of the missionaries of charity, but they informed her that that would be unwise. Um, but anyway, he has a big influence upon her. So I take him as a guide for this question of how to find a humble confidence in God, how to keep this together. He, as many saints, often employs a phrase for humility that is, I am nothing. It's a phrase that's been often repeated throughout Catholic saints and doctors of the church over the years. What does this phrase mean? That is what initially set me down this path. I really wanted to know what the saints meant by this. He puts this phrase in the context of John chapter 15 in which Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. And many saints have, over time, adjusted that to, I am nothing without you, Jesus. It is their phrasing, you could say a mystical shorthand, for attributing their graces to God. For saying that if God's using me as an instrument, Thanks be to God. And on one side, if you're saying, well, that's God's merit working within me, if you know the theology of merits or the theology of grace, one side of the coin could be, this is God working in me. And the saints would say, the flip side of the coin is to say, this is not mine. It may be real in my life, this, this merit, this work, may be a real aspect of my life, and thanks be to God for that but they do always attribute it to God and not uniquely to themselves. So John 15, five, I am the vine and you are the branches. He has a second line that he often includes with that, and it's that with God, we can do all things. That will speak a little bit to the side of confidence and what we hope to uh, uh, receive from God by way of this type of humble confidence in him. Uh, but first, let us ground ourselves in this approach. Here is a, a short little passage of spiritual direction he writes, it's beautiful. Oh, my dear child, I would wish to engrave on your heart 
in letters of gold this truth, that no matter how great our misery, we are infinitely rich in Jesus Christ. If we unite with him, if we lean on him, if we realize by a firm living faith that all the value of our prayer and of all that we do comes from his merits in us. This is contained in two texts. Without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. I can do all things in him who strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. On the side of humility, this is perhaps the harder side of this two-sided coin, though we may in a second see that there are actually uh, difficulties in placing our full confidence in God and surrendering to him deeply uh, in, in various ways. But on the side of humility, this notion of how do we, how do we beyond this intellectual explanation of this, how do we come to, you know, bring this into our hearts? And his answer is threefold. He says, well, if you think of your past, it's pretty easy to think of moments when you have perhaps not lived up to your calling, moments of sin when we've limited our full flourishing. He says that when we think of today, then we can stay grounded in this, nece this nece uh, necessity of turning to God for help, this dependence upon God's grace. And if grace is a new term for you, I should stop for a second and define it. This notion of it's just as simple as God's power at work in a person. A and to make that a little bit more tangible, um, let's think of the higher power that people discuss when they're in a 12-step program, that kind of transformative power of God at work in a person, that healing, transforming, perfecting power of God. Sometimes we think it's rather easy to think, yes, God can be at work in that treatment program, but sometimes we fail to see that God wants to be work, at work deeply within us all the time in this healing, transforming, perfecting kind of way. Indeed, the Bible says that this is the will of God, your sanctification. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3b. This notion is that God actually is willing each of us to be the very best versions of ourself, thriving completely in our own unique ways, replanning that, because we believe if he wills it, it's, it's an act, so he's working on it, and replanning it as many times as necessary so that from this point to the end of our lives, we can become, with God's help, the most amazing versions of ourselves, if we but let him. Marmion's very good on this topic. He recognizes that at every Mass, there is the fullness of grace of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. At every Mass, there's enough grace to make each of us into a saint, if we but let him. So if we didn't wake up as saints this morning, then perhaps we have to address our side of our response to God's grace. And that's where this notion of removing our obstacles comes in. And we all know that at a very basic level, don't sin mortally, don't go, into, you know, don't go outside the bounds of Christian, Christian moral teaching. We know that part. That part's, at least in this group, I think an established fact. But this spirituality 
asks that question about that interior response to God, that deeper yes that still needs to be unleashed, that deeper surrender that still needs to be unleashed, of saying, you, God, do whatever you want to do through me today or in this life, and not limiting that to something. It's that openness to grace or as St. Therese says, that coming to God with empty hands, that's just a rephrasing of this notion of I am nothing, that coming to God with empty hands is a way of requesting that they be filled, but filled in the way that God wants to fill them, filled with his blessings on the path he has for us. The great takeaway of this notion that the will of God is our sanctification is that there is an intense path of blessing for each person. The Father has that path of blessing already planned. We just have to get on to the path and stay on it. And this is one of those ways that the saints have used to receive graces in fuller measure. So turning our attention now to the other side of the equation, confidence in God. So we talked a little bit about our past and easily seen that we've perhaps limited ourselves and our full flourishing in the past. We've talked about today wanting to be dependent upon God, but now we know that going forward there are two paths. And one is presumption. <laughs> One is, I will do this, God. I'll do this for you. Or I'll do what I want to do for you. And that is not a path that's going to lead to blessing. The other path is to, to have this combination of humble confidence in God and to allow God's path to manifest itself and to follow those blessings on that path. And it may seem odd that I'm highlighting uh, such a concept as presumption to a, a community like this, um, but I think that deep within us, deep within all of us, is this real desire to give God a gift. Like we really have the thing we want to give to God or the many things we want to give to God, which are filling our hands so that we're not just covered with empty heads, asking him what he wants to do in us and with us. And also tied in with that is that we all, perhaps the reason we do that, is that we all come in complete to God and we're kind of scared of it. You know, if we could be the Catholic man of the year, that's a plug, or the Catholic woman of the year, uh, forms are out back. Please, you know, fill them out for St. Joseph's Evangelization Network. Um, then maybe we could, you know, appear at the pearly gates with some confidence. But that's not really the case either. Right? We all come deeply incomplete before God. And yes, we're kind of desperately trying not to, but we still will. And we have to allow God to complete us. We have to allow, in a very Catholic phrasing, allow the Sacred Heart you know, to, to, to fill in for us. Let Jesus be what is presented on our behalf. There's this beautiful prayer of daily neglects which says, um, Eternal Father, I offer you the Sacred Heart of Jesus with all its love, all its sufferings, and all its merits first to expiate the sins I've committed this day and during all my life. Second, to purify the good I've done badly this day and during all my life. And third, to minister for the good I ought to have done this day and during all my life. And it's with that confidence that we can come before God, <laughs> that ultimate judgment, and let Jesus provide but it's also with some semblance of that same confidence that we can let ourselves surrender a little bit more to let God lead our lives the way he wants to lead it. 
Marmion's very strong about how he believes that we all relive Christ's mysteries if we but let him. So for example, every Lent as it is now, we die to self just a little bit, or we allow Christ within us to die to self a little bit. And every Easter we have the joy of the resurrection. Every Christmas we have those simple joys of the nativity. And the other mysteries of the rosary, the other mysteries of Jesus' life, evangelization and such, recur. But he says that we allow those mysteries, and very much in a liturgical mindset, we allow those mysteries to be um, relived in each of us. And the more we're open to say that path, rather than our own path of worldly success, or importance, whatever it is that you find important, you get to define it. But those are the ways we get off of that path of allowing Christ to just relive his life within us in our own unique ways. He takes confidence that God wants to make him a saint. And in that simple confidence, he just stays on God's path and allows him to bless him. And perhaps with a little bit of St. Therese coming more with empty hands saying, I'm nothing without you, Lord. Will you please give this talk through me tonight? It'll be better if you deliver it than if I just do it the best I could alone. You, Lord, can you be with me as I'm out being a lawyer today? Can you help me in this deposition, whatever it is? Can you ask the questions? Can you inspire this conversation? Or with uh, young kids, Dan, thanks for the plug. Young kids are hard to work with sometimes. Can you, Lord, this child is, is grieving. No one knows how to talk to a child when they're grieving. Can you, Lord, somehow speak to this child what he needs to hear? Or just be present to the child in the way that the child can receive it? It's those moments when it's easier to turn to God, but I think God wants to have that sort of relationship with us all the time. So it's these little prayers. When I was in the work world, I used to say, when the phone rang, you have three seconds when you've already set something else down before you have to answer. You could say a simple, come Holy Spirit, be with me. And over the rhythm of the day and several calls, you can build that rhythm into your life. Or each time you go into a meeting, when you cross the threshold, say, come, Holy Spirit, do this through me. The saints simply add this extra layer of, I really want you to do this through me. I'm nothing without you. Like, I am likely to goof this up if you don't really do this through me. And I'm confident that you will, and come, help. It's this very simple approach of humble confidence that allowed St. Therese, Marmion, Mother Teresa, etc., to open up their interior response to God. These are the simple dispositions that can really open up a prayer life, that can really open up one's active life, but can really transform how one approaches life. And I would love to talk with you more on the topic there is the book, of course. Um, I'm holding a school of prayer right now over at St. Louis Abbey on the next five Thursdays in the monastery building. I have a flyer and books out back. Um, so for more information, there's other opportunities. But before I go, I want to give you just a taste of the fruit of it all. Here is Marmion on union with God. God acts towards us as we act towards him. God, as it were, measures his providence according to our attitude in relation to him. And the more we give ourselves to him, the more we look upon him as our father, as the spouse of our souls, the more his providence enters into the least details and circumstances of our life. For a soul totally surrendered to him God has ineffable delicacies which show that his gaze is ever fixed upon it. Never has mother cared for her child. 
Never has friend gladdened his friend, as God cares for and gladdens this soul. This soul is perfectly free and detached from self and from creatures. It is the captive of nothing whatsoever, neither of an employment nor of a charge. It seeks and desires God, and when it has found him, its every desire is fulfilled. God is the sovereign master of this soul. Nothing in it disputes this sovereignty. It procures him incomparable glory by the continual homage of utter self-surrender. The Lord works great things through it, and its life has the most wonderful repercussion in the spiritual world. The liberty possessed by souls thus given to God brings them great peace and deep joy. They know that God is a Father full of goodness, that he loves them and wills to bring them to himself. What have they to fear? God guides them. Nothing is wanting to them, neither light nor grace. Dominus regit me et nihil mihi deret. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. They live in the abundance of divine gifts and in an inward peace passing all understanding. That beautiful notion of being captive of nothing whatsoever encapsulates what's possible by grace if you allow grace to heal and transform and perfect you. If you allow this humble confidence to push out the world's ways, that excessive focus on importance, and to allow God to fill the space left behind. It seems that Blessed Columba says that if we do this simple little task, never has mother cared for her child, never has friend gladdened his friend, as God cares for and gladdens this soul. Thank you.